Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning into Song and Beyond. This is the last episode that I am guest hosting, and I'm really thrilled to have gotten a chance to do this for the month of April. Thanks to Thomas Hampson and Christy Finn for inviting me to do this. I have talked with various people over the course of the month and started the month in a conversation with Thomas Hampson where we talked about the Women's Song Forum, a group of scholars and performers and educators that has created a website devoted to women's voices in song. And I talked with a number of people who are part of that group. In the first conversation, we also talked about Fanny Hensel and a book that I just edited called The Songs of Fanny Hensel. So I thought it would be fun to circle back to Fanny Hensel and to two dear friends and wonderful scholars who have written a lot about her music. And they are Susan Wallenberg from Oxford University and Larry Todd from Duke University. Thank you, Susan and Larry, for taking the time to talk with me. I'm, I'm delighted to have you here. Thanks so much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure it's, to be involved. It's wonderful to see you. I was thinking when I saw you last, Susan, I think it probably was in person last. It was probably the, the Clara Schumann conference at Oxford, which was what, yes. two summers ago? Is that right? Yeah, when the three of us were, yes, this is absolutely, and it's still vivid in my mind. Mine too. It's It's been a long time since we've seen each other in person, and I look forward to a time when we can do that at a, at a conference. But thanks to the wonders of technology, we can we can talk to each other today. I thought maybe a good starting point would be to ask kind of a simple question, but the answer may be, may be complex. And that is, I'd like each of you to, to answer this. What do you love most about Fanny Hensel's songs? And she wrote a lot of them, right? She wrote 249 of them. So they're mm -hmm. different, they're varied. It may be hard to isolate certain things that you love, but I'd love to hear what you love most about her songs. Maybe Susan, can we start with you? Oh, <laughs> it's um, so hard when there are so many things I love to say. I don't want to go on forever because uh, 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 it's got to be fairly concise. So I'll plump for knowing her a little bit. Uh, I wish I could meet her. She's somebody I'd have loved to meet. Um, but knowing her a little bit from her letters, from reading about her life, I feel I do get a sense of the person. I mean, there are all these arguments about how far a composer puts themselves into, but of course they do. They're bound to because they're doing the composing. So it's her strength of spirit for me that comes through. Her love of music and of poetry and of what she's doing in fusing them together mm -hmm. uh, comes across. Uh, and I, I think she was just avid uh, as a songwriter for more. She would, I, I think if she'd gone on, as we wish she had to a longer life, I can see her being like Schubert and just song would always be, or almost always be what she wanted to be doing. Yeah, that term strength of spirit is really, it's really so true that she, she persisted in writing music, writing songs, writing many different things, despite the obstacles that were in her way. It's, it's as though she had no other choice. She was just so, so driven to do this and such a natural at it. Larry, what would you say? What is it that you love most about her songs? And you know them very well. I should, I should mention that uh, Larry published a wonderful life and work study uh, called um, uh, Fanny Hensel, the Other Mendelssohn in 2010. And Susan, you organized a wonderful uh, colloquium that was published in 19th Century Music Review, Review in 2007. So you spent a lot of time with her music, longer than I have actually. Larry, what do you love most about her songs? Well, I'd say she's she's, um, one of the great songwriters of all time. And songwriters, um, um, the best ones, understand how to um, match the right music with the right poetry. Uh, they paint on a, a, a very small uh, canvas. They are basically miniaturists. And so what that means is that um, every note, every word really counts. And uh, Fanny Hensel was a composer who understood that um, a very concise musical gesture, a motive, a chord, a harmonic progression could speak volumes, even though it might only require a second or two to lapse in terms of hearing it. She had a friend, um, Sarah Austin, who was a translator, who said that in her opinion, Fanny Hensel 
felt much, much more than she actually said. And I think that speaks volumes too uh, about Hensel's music. You have a sense of the depth of the music. Um, looking at her songs is really entering into a diary-like world because most of these songs were composed really for her small circle of friends. Um, few were published during her lifetime. Uh, it's only the last year of her life that she started publishing under her, really under her name and uh, assigning opus numbers to them. So it's, it's a blend of many things. Uh, the songs are autobiographical. Um, many of them treat the, the, the best lyric poetry of the time that, you know, the great poets, be it Goethe or Heine or Lenau or Eichendorf. Um, and Hensel is, is one who really rose to the occasion and, you know, like Schubert and Schumann and her brother um, and Brahms and the others, you know, she belongs to this amazing tradition. So there are just a few ideas I could go on. Larry, a follow-up question. So you, you're mentioning some of the um, some of the hallmarks of her style that make her songs what they are. Could you tell me and the listeners, since people may not know, what was her kind of um, bread and butter music? What music was she listening to? What, what composers were kind of funneled into her songwriting style? And I, I realize this is a tricky question because for so long, it seems to me her music has been compared with the music of other composers. And there's a lot of great work being done now by the by both of you and others to try to isolate what makes her music her music. Nonetheless, it's interesting to think about what influences were shaping this, the, the music that she was writing. Could you talk about that? Um, I'll sure try. It's, it's a great question. Um, first of all, we need to understand that she was initially directed toward the idea of writing songs really by her father, um, Abraham. Abraham, in a very famous statement uh, comparing uh, Felix and Fanny uh, writes Fanny and explains that while music might become the foundation of Felix's life, and this is in the 1820s, and he uses the term Grundbass, which is actually a music theoretical term, um, he says to Fanny that for you, music will be an ornament, it's sirda, um, not the root of your being. Um, and he's associating songwriting with the, the domestic sphere. And Fanny is directed to, uh, you know, not to think about life as a professional musician. We, we might get into the various reasons why that was at the time. You know, it's gender, it's also class issues. The Mendelssohn's were uh, very affluent um, and there are other complicating factors. Um, but basically the song was along with the short character piano piece. These, these were two genres in which Fani initially found her niche as a composer um, because they're associated with domestic music making. Now, when we think of domestic music making, we, we might think of a small group of people, you know, we might think of Schubert uh, having his friends over and having a Schubert theater. Uh, in Fani's case, it, it was on a much grander scale. The, the Mendelssohn residents had a uh, music saal, a music room that could uh, accommodate about a hundred or so. And in the summer they could, move a glass portico and open up the space so that guests could spill out into, onto the lawns. And there might be as many as 200 people coming to her concerts in the Mendelssohn residence um, to hear music making. Um, so um, in a way that, that was uh, you know, where she started. In terms of the, the direct you know, influence of other song composers, that's, a, you know, that's, that's a, a still a bit of a mystery. In, in the Mendelssohn's time in the 1820s, you know, they both studied with Zelter and Zelter was a relatively prolific composer of songs, but for him, you know, songs were a genre in which the music was there to support the poetry. It was not there to challenge the poetry or to operate on the same level as the poetry. Um, Zelter was of course a Dutz fr friend of Goethe, and uh, he said a lot of poems of Goethe. Uh, Goethe's idea was that uh, the music was um, there to support the declamation of the poetry and that in the, in the ideal song, you know, you might think of it as a hot air balloon. The music is elevating the, the text into our 
of you know the forefront of our consciousness, but it's not doing anything else. Uh, Fani, being uh, a marvelous pianist, uh, as was of course her brother, um, was interested um, in having the piano be a little more involved. She she never d really went to the extent that that did Schumann, who you know Robert Schumann would sometimes end songs with lengthy piano postludes and. And of course, Schubert um, elevated the piano part into something that it hadn't been before. Um, but Fanny was uh, moving in that direction. In her very best songs, you have the sense that the, the music and the poetry are mirroring each other. So the music is like a reading of the poetry. And the poetry, um, even though it exists before the music, is somehow responding to what's happening in the music. And that's what makes her, her, her art so powerful and meaningful and, and really so human and so emotional. I agree that, um, so she studied with, with Selter and some of her early songs uh, seem to be in that style where, I love your idea of a, of a hot air balloon where the music is kind of lifting up the poetry and yes. bringing it to the forefront of our minds. But already, I feel like in the 1830s, even a little before then, she's starting to exert her interpretive Will. And one song that comes to mind, which, which Susan, you shared with me and you, you wrote about in your chapter from the songs of Fanny Hensel is Schwanenlied or Swan Song, which is the first of her opus one. So she finally decides late in her life to publish her music. And this is the first song that appears in the first opus. So clearly it's a song that, that matters to her. I wonder if we could spend a little time with that song because it seems to be a, a good example of so that song is from 1839-40, am I right? Roughly that time frame. That's a song where she's really kind of coming into her own as a composer. Susan, could you, because you've written about that song so beautifully and you know it so well, could you tell us, tell us a little about the song, when it was written? Um, I have the text here and could, could read the Heine poem that she set, but just tell us about the song and what, what you love about that particular song and how it, it it shows signs of her, her interpretive voice. Swan song. Yeah. Yes, well, Larry has written about this, of course, uh, quoting her description of a scene that could well relate to it. So it's all linked with her travels. Um, I was writing about her travel songs in which I felt actually composing gave women freedom. They made choices when they composed, but travel, because they couldn't travel as freely. And it was a wonderful thing when she could actually go to Italy, which she had yearned to do and Felix had done. And she uh, always avidly um, mopped up everything he told her about places he went to, but then she sort of got, perhaps didn't get to them herself till later. And um, so it's, it's linked with a scene of swans on a lake, but, but the song itself, I think, the bittersweetness of it is what strikes me in the poem and that she gets in her music. It's a water song, but it doesn't do water in a conventional way, if there's such a thing, but, but not in an obvious way, let's say. She does it in her own way. But you're not sure where it's going, what turns it will take, and something is elongated or it's not, or something comes back differently. She's a great varia, which is a sign of something to do with choices, not just reproducing and repeating, but actually varied repeats of material. I love your idea about how she uses the piano accompaniment in this song. And Lara, you mentioned Schubert. When I think of Schubert, I think of, of a composer who knew how to write an accompanimental pattern that wasn't just a pattern, you know, that right. expressed, that could, could, could vividly um, depict something in the natural world, like a stream or a brook or something, but could also convey some, some underlying emotion. And I think that's true in this song. Uh, I was gonna uh, clarify or just make sure I'm right. This song was written when she was in Italy. Is that correct? It's from yeah. uh, 1840, I believe. Was she in Italy when she wrote it, Susan? Um, I'd have to have looked that up and been sure, but it may be from after her return journey, um, but of course, the which was 1839 to 40, wasn't it? But it's vivid, the, the if experience will have been vivid for her. 
could we listen to it? Maybe what I'll do is I'll read the, the English translation. And then I found uh, a recording by a singer I didn't know well, uh, um, a German speaking singer, Elisabeth Breuer, and the pianist is Sigurd Hennemann. I'm gonna read the text, which is a Heinrich Heine poem, and then we'll listen to the song. And I think your idea, Susan, about the accompaniment doing more than just um, depicting the, the water, but conveying emotion, and also the way the song sort of takes surprising turns. Those are a couple of things we could listen, listen for. So here's the text, and then I'll, I'll play the recording. This is Heinrich Heine. It's called Swan Song. A star falls to earth from its glittering height. That is the star of love I see falling there. The apple tree sheds a host of white leaves. Cajoling breezes come along and play with them. A swan sings on the lake, gliding to and fro, and singing ever more softly dives into its watery grave. It is so silent and dark, blossom and leaf have disappeared. The song of the swan has faded away. So here is swan song. So there is Fanny Hensel's swan song. What what do you think, listening to that, any, any thoughts come to your mind about what makes that such an extraordinary song? I, I would say that the, you know, we've talked about the piano accompaniment being sort of deceptively simple. It really is a metaphor for water, uh, which in turn is sort of a metaphor for the transience of life. You know, the swan song, the, the Swan sings this beautiful melody and then dies. And so it's a lament. And um, um, Fanny Hensel is able to give us, you know, some indications of this, this sort of subtext uh, that's lurking there. One is in the, in the second strophe, you know, there's, there is this fermata where, where everything stops momentarily, right? The silence. And the silence speaks speaks volumes. We have to fill in that silence. Uh, it's a kind of harbinger by the very end of the song. Um, that's, that's the moment. That's the line is dives into its watery grave. That's precisely right. when the music when we reach that fermata. 
That's right. And so then the, the lament-like signal would be the, the descending stepwise motion in, in the bass or that's occasionally implied, you know, it's an old symbol of, of, of lament. So she's put that in there as well. It's, it's a song that's constructed of deceptively simple means and anybody listening to it can can latch onto the melody and can enjoy the piano accompaniment and reading the text can extract meaning from it. And, you know, we assume that this is almost artless, but there's a lot of art that goes into this. And the great songwriter is, is those are the ones who un understand that everything is in the details, that, you know, that, that pause in the second strophe uh, is huge. Uh, some of the chromatic inflections, you know, they, they are of enormous consequence even though we're dealing here with a song that only lasts a few minutes. And you use the word lament. Um, there's, a, there's a moment in both strophes actually, and maybe this, this is pushing a bit too hard, but the, the bass line descends chromatically outlining yeah. like a lament tetrachord. And so there's so much that's packed into this, into this small space. And Susan mentioned the, the term bittersweet. I think that, that captures the essence of it. It's a piece in G minor, but it's going to end in G major and the G major uh, is not expected, you know, but suddenly there it is. And that little twist of the semitone from B flat to B natural, um, you know, really makes, gives us the, the full import of the song. It's, it's just beautiful, beautiful piece. I'm going to be a bit cheeky here and read something from Larry's book. <laughs> but I, I looked up quickly. Um, so this is they'd left for Italy and they were on their way towards the end of uh, fall 1839, wasn't it? Um, and it, on a nearby alpine lake on their way, um, Fanny observed swans resembling, I quote, floating stars on the dark green water. And Larry goes on to say, a striking image she likely recalled when within a year she composed the wistful Schwanenlied. So that's the kind of dating we're talking about. Um, but I love the way also she dwells when she wants to on a, a syllable and the melisma, the writing of a florid melody with lots of notes to one syllable is something that an artistic use of it is so effective. If you do it a lot, it becomes less effective. She chooses her moments. And she does that so much in, in her songs. That's that's a, a real hallmark, these, these yeah. spinning melodies at the end. the end. I think she saw some kind of apotheosis, really, that made her do that, coming into a, a whole flourish in the voice. Maybe we can shift a bit. There's another song that I'd like to listen to before we're, we're done, but um, I think it's really important to ask both of you a question about Hensel scholarship not just her music, but the, the writing on her music, because mm. both of you have, have worked for so long to help to bring her music more to the fore, to write so beautifully about it, to encourage others to do the same. Could you talk about how you see Hensel scholarship having changed, having developed over the past, oh, let's say 20 years or so? What, what has changed in 20 years and what do you think has accounted for some of those changes? Sure. Well, I guess the first thing to, to say is that Fanny Hensel is, you know, she has a relatively short critical tradition because until the 1990s, the vast majority of her compositions were, were just not known. They were in family archives, you know, with the fall of the wall in 1989 and the reorganization of the uh, libraries in Berlin a lot of these materials came into the Mendelssohn Archive and for the first time scholars could have uh, access to them and we had, you, we gradually, but suddenly it was like a deluge mm -hmm. of compositions, you know, she wrote a string quartet, well we didn't know that, she wrote a, you know, Das Jahr, this wonderful uh, set of 12 pieces on the months of the year for piano, it's about an hour in length, she wrote cantatas, we didn't know about that, and so this is a composer who, you know, when she died in 1847, um, a few pieces came out uh, up to 1850, and then, you know, the, everything just fell into oblivion. And we had, 
we had no no way of knowing uh, the full extent of, of what she had written. So that's one thing that that's changed, just just uh, the availability of this, so that we can begin to assess her her life and her music and understand that, you know, she provides you know a, a new window into the 19th century. We used to think that we knew the 19th century all too well. We had all of the canonic figures and so forth, and that was it. And the music histories were were finished. But now he, here we have a Fanny Hensel and and a Clara Schumann and an Amy Beach and many, many other uh, women composers who are writing wonderful music. And this all needs to be contextualized. Um, the wonderful thing about Fanny Hensel is that it is happening. Um, you know, there's been this explosion of activity, uh, in, including your edited volume on the songs and, you know, the diaries which were published in, I think, 2004, somewhere around there, and much of this music. So now, now we have a chance to sort of write the historical record and to have a, have a fresh look. Um, and going forward, I think, you know, we're, we're just going to see more and more of this. Um, hopefully we'll get to the point where there will be a, a complete edition of her music. You know, that's something mm -hmm. that we still need. Well, I know that um, uh, a graduate student, uh, and Susan, you may, you may know him, Timothy Langston is currently um, putting together um, the, the, the edited uh, notated versions of the songs from the manuscripts and the manuscripts are now um, thankfully almost all of them I think are available online so you don't have to travel to Berlin to see them and Timothy is also I learned recently trying to put together recordings of many of her songs he himself is a really gifted gifted tenor so there's um, the wind is in is in is in Hensel's sails, and that's that's a really great thing. Susan, how would you respond to that question? What what have you seen change over the past twenty years? Where do you see things going in Hensel studies? Oh, an enormous change. Um, things that are in place now that were just not there before. And um, I was just looking up in the letters of Fanny to Felix Mendelssohn, um, edited by Marcia Citron, that that was in the late nineteen eighties. 1987, mm -hmm. and it was an astonishing achievement in view of what Larry was saying about the difficulties, and Marsha has written herself about those difficulties, and everything as you've been saying just now, it's in general things have opened up a lot more for scholarship, but certainly for Fanny Hensel they have, um, and it was a delight, you know, when we had the Hensel Bicentenary Conference in 2005, and um, Larry then went on to do his biography of Felix and clearly Fanny was calling to him and we knew in 2005 that he was hoping to do more and of course then he followed Felix with the biography of Fanny and that's a marvellous thing which previously nobody thought of doing. It's unbelievable that there was this sister who was, as Goethe said, equally gifted um, and people just didn't look. They wrote about Felix, and if Fanny got mentioned, it was as an appendage to him, probably. It's really worth pointing out that people like Marcia Citron were doing this very early and, and, and trying to overcome their own obstacles, um, difficulty accessing the, the manuscripts. So we, we owe people like Marcia a huge debt of gratitude, but you're right, Larry, that now, and this is, this is for those of you who love her music, who um, find recordings on YouTube because they're really readily available, the music is now available and the diaries are available and the letters um, between her and her brother are available. So the, the material is finally out there, thanks to people like Marsha and, and the two of you who've, who've helped to bring it to, into light. And that means I think more attention to her music, more analysis of her music, more performance of her music, because the, finally we have the stuff and we can, we can do more with the stuff. Yes, but it, if I can break in, um, just to say it occurs to me that also genre, the lead is a genre, that it, there's a, a, an ambivalence, isn't there, about it? it's a small scale. And Fanny Hensel herself said, she, uh, this is an ingrained message that women tended to have somewhere, it sort of was in the consciousness that they were better at small scale than, than large scale. But actually the lead also after Schubert became more prestigious as a, a genre. But, but what's so astonishing is that people could have told the story of the German lead as a, an all-male story because mm -hmm. there were all these women writing hundreds of them and, and they were just not, not in the picture. Um, 
it's marvelous now that they are. Well, maybe we can, um, I wanna make sure we talk about some of those women. Before we do that though, I thought it would be good to listen to one more piece by, by Fanny, kind of as a, um, um, a final moment in, in discussing her music. And we can, we can come back to her at the end, of course. One song that you um, have written about Larry, and I know it's, it's one of your favorites, and it's one of her last songs, it's quite late in her career, is Dein ist mein Herz. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe we could give that song a listen because it's, it's different from Schwan and Lied. It's, um, it's more forceful, it's more dramatic, but it has some of the, the typical Henselian touches. Could you uh, tell us a little about that song, when it was written, what it's about? I have the text here and I can read it before we, before we listen to the performance of it. Yeah, it's, it's from 1846, so it's late. And it was published as her Opus 7, number six. So uh, that would have been, let's see, that would have been one of the um, opuses, opera that, that came out in 1850, posthumously. Um, and the story behind that, it, it, we're just now realizing is that that was probably one of the last things her brother, uh, Felix, did after Fanny died in May of 1847. Uh, Felix went off to, um, he was absolutely devastated and he went off to Switzerland. Uh, he stopped composing for a, a few months and he, he spent his time doing uh, watercolors, some marvelous paintings of Swiss landscapes. Um, but he met with um, his publisher, Hertel from Breitkopf and Hertel, and arranged for some of Fanny's um, pieces to appear as her uh, Opus 7, 8, nine and 10. And um, so this presumably would have been one of his favorite ones as well. Um, what's extraordinary about this is uh, it shows Fanny at her most experimental. And, um, you know, she is a composer who always was interested in chromaticism. Part of that comes from her deep interest in the music of J.S. Bach. And um, uh, listeners or uh, viewers may not know that Felix often referred to his sister as his Thomas Contour. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have to remember that Fanny was about three and a half years older than Felix. So it was the same age disparity as between the, uh, the Mozarts, Nannerl and Wolfgang. Um, so um, this song, uh, Dynast Mein Herz, um, My Heart is Yours, uh, begins with a, a striking piano prelude. It, it's in the key of uh, C sharp major, which is an extreme key. You don't find that very often anywhere. Um, filled with chromaticism, double sharps. Um, and it plays on the uh, major versus minor um, polarity. So it's in C sharp major, but at times it turns to C sharp minor. So again, it's, there's this bitter sweet quality to it. The, uh, when the singer comes in, the vocal line is basically a descending chain of thirds, uh, a complete chain of thirds. It starts on an E sharp, goes down by thirds, eventually recircles and, and gets back to the, uh, to the E sharp. Um, in terms of the poem, and perhaps you can read it in a moment, the, the uh, second stanza uh, to me seems most telling. Um, the translation I have reads, the dearest thing I may acquire in songs that abduct my heart is a word to me that they please you, a silent glance that they touch you. Um, pretty amazing poetry there. And, you know, one wonders if she is directing this toward her husband, uh, Wilhelm, the, the court painter um, uh, with whom she shared what she described as a double counterpoint of painting and music, mm -hmm. or also if she's not also directing it to her brother, Felix, you know, the trying to get his approval for her emergence as a professional composer who is, you know, in the final year of her life, um, starting to publish her songs under her own name um, so that she, you know, is defining her own creative space. I think these are issues that I think are involved in, in this piece. And um, it's, it's one of her best, in my opinion. Well, let me, um, I'll read the poem. And I actually have the same translation, which I think is your translation from your book. So uh, that's fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, this is a poem by Nicholas Lenau. And it's worth mentioning that 
Um, Lena would have um, been a, 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 a kind of a, an odd choice for, for, for her to set because um, he was very much a, a poet of, of the time, of, a very, of, of her time period. And of course, there are other Lenau settings, I think of Robert Schumann's Opus 50, yeah. but that's from later. So she, she's setting Lenau a little earlier than, than other song composers, which shows her, her desire to find new and interesting poetry. So this is Lenau, Dein ist mein Herz. Thine is my heart, my pain, thine own, and all the joys that burst forth. Thine is the forest and all its branches, all its blossoms and songs. And here's the stanza that, that Larry was referencing. The dearest thing I may acquire in songs that abduct my heart is a word to me that they please you, a silent glance that they touch you. That's the poem. And then what Hensel does is repeat the opening stanza. And I think when we listen, what you described there, the, the kind of intimacy of the address in the second stanza, whether it's to Wilhelm or to, to Felix, that really comes out in the music. It shifts to major, it sounds more, um, more like um, speaking to a, to a loved one before we return to the, the more vigorous and, and turbulent opening. So here's a recording of Dein It's My Herz by Emily Pogorelk, P-O-G-O-R-E-L-C, and Danielle Orlando. This is interestingly a, um, a degree recital, I think a senior recital from Curtis, but it's a great performance from just a couple of years ago. So here is mm -hmm. Ansel's Dein Ist Mein Herz. Beautiful. Beautiful. You, you mentioned the major minor shifts and bittersweet is a term that's come up uh, multiple times at the very end when she goes up to her high note. So getting a little music theory here, but that's a cadential 6-4, but it's a minor cadential 6-4, right? right. <laughs> major key song. So there's so many subtle shifts between major and minor that allow mm -hmm. her to kind of track the, the shifting and ambiguous emotions of the speaker. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, with that beautiful performance, we can wrap up the Hensel part of the hour. And again, we can come back to her at the, at the end. But Susan, you mentioned before we turn to this song that we 
used to tell the history of 19th century music, 19th century leader as one that involved men primarily, if not exclusively. And of course, there are so many other women composers writing not just German leader, but songs in the 19th century. I thought it would be worth shifting to some of those other women song composers that, that you love, that you think are important, that others should be spending more time with. And Susan, maybe I'll turn to you first. What, which other, and there's so many to choose from, other female song composers from this time period or even into the 20th century, do you love dearly that, that you think others should be, should be spending even more time with? I feel I'm still always exploring more of this repertoire. There's so much I'd like to know about still. Um, but from what I know already, I've become convinced that Clara Schumann has been undervalued for her songs and um, really ought to be valued highly. I wrote about Liebsturm Schönheit, which I just adore, but Marsha Citroen wrote about that early on. The, we sh don't forget the pioneering work these people mm -hmm. did, but, but it's all come out much more into the open since, and we've got more editions, we've got more recordings, we still need more again. Um, so Clara Schumann songs, but that's probably you would want to talk about because I know you're working on them. Well, I, I agree. I'm, I'm working on a book about Clara Schumann songs. And yeah. I, I think if, thankfully today, if, if you asked someone, maybe not someone on the street, but maybe, or certainly a musician, um, tell me a couple of female song composers from the 19th century, they wouldn't say, there were female song composers in the 19th century, they would probably say Fanny Hensel and Clara Schumann. And, and I, it's, it's so heartening to know that, that people are finally uh, not just putting their music in historical context, which is crucial, but also looking at the music, really treating the music as, as the glorious art that it is. But there are so many others as well. And, and I, like you, Susan, I've been so happily uh, discovering new composers I, I didn't know about uh, who wrote extraordinary music. Yeah, and we've known for a while now about Josefina Lang, thanks to Harold and Sharon Krebs. And there's a composer who devoted herself to song so amazingly prolifically and wonderful and, and inventive songs. Uh, I'd like to know more of those. Those are extraordinary pieces. Yes, I've come across have been marvellous. And we, speaking of pioneers, we really do owe Harold Krebs and, and Sharon Krebs a huge debt of gratitude for publishing their book on Josefina Long's songs. And that's something that I've shared with my students and they've become really enamored with her, with her pieces. Mm -hmm. One composer, Susan, that you, you sent a recording, uh, a song by this composer. And I have to confess, um, this is a composer that I did not know particularly well, um, but boy, I really love the song you sent. And that's Madeline Dring. Could you tell us a little about who she was and how she fits into the bigger picture of of 19th and 20th century songs and she was writing in the 20th century. She, she was writing in the 20th century. Yeah, I don't have a date for her songs uh, uh, in my mind at the moment, but it's probably mid 20th century. She lived from 1920, she had a relatively short she, life. She, she lived from, from 1930 to 77. Yeah, for about, uh, her life was the 30s to the 70s, I think. Mm -hmm. But although she's 20th century, she, partly I think links, certainly the songs I've been listening to recently, she links with earlier composers of the century who in the English tradition were looking back and writing in this what I call antique style, but she does that in some Shakespeare settings, I think to wonderful effect because she combines it with her own modernity. And I love the, the fusion she achieves by that. Also because these are some of them very profound settings. So the one I mentioned to you, take or take those lips away. It's very deep, emotionally intense. And I find student performances, for instance, of Dring for recitals that we have and they choose, they tend to like the cabaret type songs she wrote. They like and the more uh, amusing poetry that she said. Uh, but the lighter songs are wonderful as well in that way but I found this darker side of her most interesting. Well, maybe we could listen to this song. And again, this is a song I didn't know, but I think you're right, Susan, that it has, it sounds sort of antique. It has a kind of 
um, for lack of a better term, a little bit of an old fashioned quality. And I don't mean that negatively, but there are a few moments where it's quite chromatic. <laughs> it sounds quite like of the 20th century. And it's interesting how she's mingling those, those different voices, those, those different ways of writing music. Yeah, you have a feeling, don't you, that, mind you, we could have said this about Fanny Hemsel in a different way, that the key is unstable. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is a key, there's a sense of a key, it's a minor key, um, and she's very minor in it a lot of the time, but, but you feel it's not entirely stable. She could move, she could be a bit more fluid with key, and that's the modernity, yes. Well, I'll, I'll do what I've done before with the other songs. I'll read the text. This is a Shakespeare text from Measure for Measure. Uh, and my, my recollection is that the context here, this is um, a, a boy speaking to a woman whom he loves but can't be with. So it's sort of a song of unrequited love. And there's a, a, a our favorite term, there's our bittersweet. There's a kind of bittersweet quality to the text and also- Yeah, got another bittersweet here. <laughs> we, evidently we like bittersweet songs. <laughs> I'll read the, the Shakespeare text and then I'll play Dring's, Dring's performance. So the text is, take, oh, take those lips away that sweetly were forsworn. And those eyes, the break of day, lights that do mislead the morn. But my kisses bring again, bring again, seals of love, but sealed in vain, sealed in vain. Mm. So this is Madeline Dring. I don't know exactly when the song was written, but sometime between uh, probably in the 30s or 40s, I'm, I'm guessing. And the performance, um, you know both of these performers. Could you, before we listen, Susan, could you tell us who the performers are? Yeah. This is the oh, they, that you sent me. Yeah. I was enchanted to find this because it's a former student from my own university and um, she made a career as a pianist and composer and it's her husband singing who's professionally a mathematician I believe um, but has a nice voice and she's a marvellous accompanist. She, I think she said she was playing on a, what she called a period piano. <laughs> um, it's they're very committed. They had a mission to do these songs, and you can hear the, the commitment. Yeah. She she wrote a book. Row Row right? Hancock Child. Yes. So Row Hancock Child wrote the book on Madeline Dring, with the the cooperation from the family. I I think she got on very well with, and and got information from them. So it's an important book in its own way. Although in some ways, you know, she's written in a quite light-hearted way about Dring, but Dring was a light-hearted person some of the time, and it, it sort of goes with the subject. But but Ro has a lot of good information in there that's um, welcome. Yeah. Well, here is um, "Take or Take Those Lips Away" by Madeline Dring. that do mislead the morn, but 
my kisses bring again, bring again, bring again. Seals of love, but sealed in vain. Sealed in vain. Seals of love. A really affecting song that what the moment that stands out to me is um, but my kisses bring again bring again there's this mm -hmm. really crunchy chromatic chord on one of on the second of the bring agains which makes this sound like a piece written in the 1930s and not a piece written in the 1830s even though it seems to channel a, a, an even earlier style than mm -hmm. the 19th century music yeah. Larry uh, I'm curious if you um, if you have composers on your list, women composers that we ought to be spending more time with, that, that you love, whose music you've, you've, you've listened to, who's on your list? Well, one would be Lily Boulanger, I think is absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is the sister of Nadia and um, Boulanger died in 1918, I think of Crohn's disease. She, she only made it to her mid twenties, mm -hmm. but uh, the, all of her music, whether it's the songs or the orchestral works um, are just exquisite. And she, you know, that was a tragedy uh, that she died so young because that, that's a major composer. She wrote a huge song cycle called uh, Clarière dans le ciel, which I recommend. It's, it's well worth exploring. Uh, viewers do not know it. Um, Clara Schumann, I would agree. Uh, Leaps to him, Schoenheit is one of my favorite leader. It's, it's absolutely, Gorgeous, you know. It is. It is so sad that that the Clara Schumanns and the Fanny Hensels, uh, because of the temper of the times, you know, basically believed that they could not be great composers. That they had these these limitations, and and that that spilled over, of course, into the other arts. George Eliot uh, famously said that, in her opinion, most novels written by, with few exceptions, most novels written written by women could have been better written by men. And, you know, imagine trying to compose or to write a novel, you know, with these sorts of ideas in, in the air. Um, but um, other composers, uh, Amy Beach, who was a very successful song composer. Um, and of course she broke out into the larger forms, a wonderful piano concerto, the Gaelic symphony um, and uh, several other large scale pieces. Um, those, those are a few. Florence Price, another one, very gifted songwriter uh, who's coming into her own um, recently. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just sort of at the beginning uh, of trying to reassess all this music. One thing I, I keep finding myself saying to my students, students of all levels, undergraduates who are taking classes with me or graduate students who are trying to find thesis and dissertation topics, there is so much good music that's, that deserves to be explored more. Uh, mm -hmm. And not just music by, by women, music by, by anyone, but especially music by women, music by composers from underrepresented groups. And you've mentioned some that um, these, these are pieces that are available. You know, the, the Boulanger scores are out there. You can get them. It's, you don't have to um, travel to Berlin and, and argue with someone in a library to get your hands on them. They're available and, and it's just waiting to be, to be dug into more. Susan, it looked like you were just about to say something. Um, I was just trying to think, Alma Mahler, well, in fact, she was Alma Schindler, wasn't she, when she wrote her songs? Those are rather neglected, and I like them very much. The ones Those are I've wonderful heard. songs, terrific songs. Um, 
there's a, a new biography on Alma, Alma Mahler, whose author I'm forgetting, it just came out a couple of years ago, um, a really a beautiful biography that tries to kind of rehabilitate her image because her image has suffered to some extent because of um, the various relationships and affairs that she had with, with men. Her songs are very good and again, available. They're out there. They're actually really good recordings of them, but not a lot of, um, kind of careful um, analysis of, of her song. So there's, there's stuff to be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and anyone who's looking for a topic, just uh, email Larry, email Susan, email me, email any of the, the other people that I've spoken with um, over this, this month, and they will point you in the direction of some wonderful music to, to spend time with. I thought maybe one question we could wrap up with is one that has us look forward. And we did a little of this when we were talking about Fanny Hensel. But you have sort of the long view because you've you've been doing this a while and you've seen the tides change. You've seen uh, people grow more interested in, in repertoire by women composers. What more is needed? What what do we what do people need to be doing more to continue to shine a light on? And maybe we can focus specifically on songs by by women composers. Can I? come in briefly on this I, because when I was in my teens we moved next to a family where the husband was the uh, a BBC music producer and an amateur baritone and I accompanied him a lot and um, I think that it's marvelous if people can get to know song repertoire like that but what I also benefited from was he analyzed so much what we were going to play and sing and I understood that this is the way that you need to analyze and to understand how something has been put together, the shaping of it and what's behind the choices that we were talking about before of harmony and key and so on. And I got into that habit and I think there's still a lot to be done on what you do professionally a lot of, and that's the analytical inquiry into this music not just for the sake of producing an analysis, but that it informs singers and pianists so importantly. And, and that these habits, I, I mean, he studied, my neighbor had studied, my parents' neighbor had studied music at university before he became a music producer on radio. Um, so he had the academic background, but he was, as a performer, he was instinctive as well. It doesn't mean you won't be, it's not going to kill the instinct. Um, to know more on the analytical, yeah. That's a beautiful point because, I mean, I think it would be one thing to say, music theorists, you need to write more about Lily Boulanger and Amy Beach and Madeline Dring. But in fact, uh, the, the better way to put it is that um, performers and lay listeners to some extent and students and scholars from many different backgrounds need to be analyzing this music. And we can think of analysis very broadly. It doesn't have to be publishing music theory articles. And I think you're absolutely right, Susan, that more, more devotion to the music and to what makes it work, what makes it expressive is, is something that, that is needed from, from many different people working in many different, different realms of, of music making. Larry, what would you say? What, what do we need? What, what's, what's necessary? Well, one, one lingering, lingering thing, although it's totally different now than it was several decades ago, you know, the, the there was this idea that if you're a song composer, you know, that's a small form and the, you know, the, the very great composers, you know, had to break out of that to be in order to be canonized or to be a great composer. So for instance, uh, when Mendelssohn went to England to give the English premiere of the Schubert Great Symphony, which Robert Schumann had uncovered in uh, Vienna and had shared with Mendelssohn, uh, there was a, a review of the performance and uh, by an anonymous English critic and the critic said, well, who is this Schubert? You know, uh, he's a song composer and anybody can write a good song or two. Now that was in the 1830s, a long, long time ago. But the idea that somebody specializing in the smaller forms, you know, uh, does not have the, the, the same gravitas as somebody writing an opera or a symphony, you know, is, is kind of nonsense. Um, we've largely escaped most of that, but there's still a little bit of that. Um, and there is something about um, learning how to focus attention on a tiny, small uh, time scale um, where everything is concentrated and everything 
is significant. Um, you know, that's that's a difficult type of appreciation to to acquire, and I, I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, and other than that, you know, we we need to understand these figures that that we've mentioned today and others that that we haven't, who will certainly be coming along, um, they need to be explored and they need, need to be welcomed. This is all music. And as I like to say to my students, you know, it's music and all music is connected. You know, ultimately it's all connected. So um, those are some, some ideas uh, about that. Well, I, I'm inspired by your ideas. I mean, it, literally it makes me want to end our meeting and go listen to more Madeline Dring and, um, <laughs> and try to play through some Lily Boulanger songs. They're very tricky. I don't think I could play through them or even sing them. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that those of you watching are equally inspired. And if you are, explore this music, reach out to us and, and, and others and continue to, to lift it up in, in whatever way you're, you're able to. Thank you, Susan and Larry. I really enjoyed seeing you, uh, getting a chance to talk with you, um, getting a, a feeling for how your, your work has, has shaped the, the study of, of women composers. I, I'm really grateful that you have done what you have done. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing if it weren't for you. And it was great to see you and get a chance to talk with you some more. Thank it's you, Steve. Be, yeah. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful and wonderful to see Susan. Stay well. And you, Larry and Thank Steve, you. lovely to see you. Likewise. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Alas, this is my final go at being the guest host. I really enjoyed it very much and I hope that you did as well. If you would like to see any of the previous episodes, they are archived and available on the Adagio platform, on YouTube, on Facebook, and you can, you can watch them at your leisure. Thank you, Thomas and Christy, for inviting me to do this. <laughs>